Fundamentally, if you think about a computer, it, it can do four things. It, it can uh, sta save some data in memory. It can retrieve that data in memory. It can add numbers together, add that data together, and it can compare that data to see if it's the same. So it does, a computer does four things. And if I came along to you in 1950 and said, well, I got this little machine here and it does four things, and you know what? It's going to change the world. And everybody is going to, you know, on, on everybody's desks, in everybody's televisions, in everybody's washing machines, it's going to be one of these devices. And it's, it's a multi-billion dollar uh, technology and industry. I think they probably would have got laughed out. You just would have laughed the idea out. But that's all a computer does. And nevertheless, all the other statements about its applicability are true. It's computing is changing every facet of life. It's reshaped the social structure of life. We depend on computers for our communications, our industry, our health and our money. They will play an even bigger part in our future. A combination of technological breakthroughs are about to transform the computer out of all recognition. The technology with the widest implications is a hybrid between the computer and the telephone. In the beginning, computers largely operated standalone big boxes in rooms on their own. Right? Two things happened. Computers got smaller right? and more of them. Right? And then computers began to be connected together. What we now have today is millions of computers worldwide connected together over high-speed links. What's happening is that information is becoming much more easy to, to access and more readily available. What's happening certainly in the States is that um, broadband cabling, fiber optic cabling is going in first of all to the workplaces and then into people's homes so that people will in say maybe two to five years time sit at home and access all of these, so all the services they require, banking, shopping, um, you know, the, all the computing facilities through a digital monitor attached to some, some style of computer. This opens up some interesting possibilities, right? to do with sharing information in a global data space. The amount of information we're talking about is huge. So one of the problems is how to access it in a meaningful and useful way. I'm working on MIPS, which is Multimedia Information Presentation System. Basically, the idea is that there's loads of databases out there with lots of different information in them in different formats. Uh, it's about a way of structuring knowledge of all sorts, video, uh, pictures, text, in a way that will make it accessible to the general public. Okay, so you could go up to the MIPS system and go to the query tool in the system and decide that you want information about Spain, and then from that you can make a choice that you want to look at Barcelona. Look at Barcelona, and then you could look for hotels, two-star hotels maybe, and it will return a list of these hotels for you, maybe sorted by when they have rooms free or the prices that they cost. But a system like MIPS, is really only the beginning. The television companies, the cable companies, the software companies, and the telephone companies are forming conglomerates because they are putting in you know, high, high speed um, broadband cabling into the workplaces and into the home. And it's through those cables you can not just transmit sound or text, which is the case now with the telephone wires, but you'll be able to transmit live video in real time. I'll switch on my TV and I'll have a little menu there of all the available films and I press it and I key in my credit card number or I swipe something and I get instantly debited or whatever. Right? That technology is available right now, it just needs deployment. Then uh, interactive video games, so I don't need to go out and buy video games, I don't need to get my Nintendos. All that stuff is available now and it's sort of just it's frightening to think of where you can go from then once you, you, once you plug the entertainment industry and the computer industry together, uh, what happens, you know.
the essence of what computers are really about is about enhancing human communication. And I think the growth of large-scale computer networks, which span the entire world, are opening this huge sort of uh, highway of information where you know, the borders between countries and, and people are breaking down because there are you know, free, easily accessible computer networks which span the entire world. I think there's a great future in you know, constructing the, the sort of infrastructure that will be necessary so that you can play chess with someone in Beijing or, or, or just transparently. And it, I think it's really fascinating the way that you know, this can be used to construct a global village, as it were. And yet the global computer network is only one aspect of computing. There are other areas of research where the goals are much more long-term. Um, the current projection for uh, a really intelligent machine that is sort of all singing and all dancing, a bit like us, is a thousand years, which I think is reasonable. There are lots of practical applications for machines that are more intelligent. Um, one obvious area is in, in natural language processing or in understanding the sort of language uh, that people speak or uh, written forms of language. And clearly something like this, like an obvious practical example of it would be uh, a voice activated typewriter or something like that. There are other obvious areas like for example in the area of vision. Uh, we clearly want to have machines that can see things in ways that are roughly equivalent to the way we see things. Uh, for. Uh, simple identification tasks or things that are even more complicated. There is one area where an intelligent computer could obviously be applied, robotics. Uh, it's the first simple robot I've built. It uses bumpers to bump into things, reverses, uh, turns through roughly 90 degrees and then continues on its merry little way. The motors are uh, servo motors, which I've taken from model aeroplanes. Um, the central computer is a microcontroller. It's a very simple but very robust uh, type of computer, which is commonly used in washing machines and video players, that type of equipment. Um, the sensors are micro switches, which are used in alarms, door switches, that type of thing. I see robotics uh, entering all spheres of life. Um, it'll probably become as uh, pervasive as the car. Uh, you'll have all those jobs you hate, like hoovering, can be done by a robot. Um, there, are, there are obviously find applications in factories, uh, but also out in the real world where robots haven't really gone before. Um, places like natural disasters, uh, sending robots down uh, mine shafts after a disaster will probably be the first application. And people are currently working on things like that. But also uh, working in space, working under the sea, things like that. But humans don't want to be. The computer industry is advancing so rapidly and expanding into so many different areas that it's hard to predict just what will happen next. This means that students of computer science should be equipped to deal with a constantly shifting technological landscape. I mean, the purpose of education is to, is to, is to train you to train yourselves over the, your career. And it's particularly important in such a rapidly evolving discipline as, as computer science. I mean, it's changed a lot, but in my opinion, the changes are only starting. You know, there are going to be dramatic changes in the next, in the next 10 years. The aim of the, of the course in Trinity is to marry practical experience with theory. People get hands-on experience. But when they leave college and they go out into industry, it's, it's probably the theory that, that will actually mean more to them in the end. Because in industry, they'll meet difficult intellectual pro problems which have to be solved and they'll be relying on their theory more than together with their, their practical experience. But the practical experience can very quickly go out of date, whereas a theory, if it's good theory, will last a career. You, what you learn is a method of learning. That's what you learn by doing the degree course. 
the course content in the degree is very wide but not too wide in that you, you lose track of what you're doing. It's diverse enough that people can see when they look, you see, look at your CV and look at the courses that you covered while at college that you have a very good founding in the fundamentals of computer science. The degree course in Trinity begins by teaching you the fundamentals of computing. The first, and the basis for all computing, is mathematics. The mathematics that we use in computing is, I said, unlike the mathematics uh, that's taught in schools. Uh, very much our mathematics is almost experimental in nature. Most sciences address the natural world and try to model things that happen in the natural world. And for that, they use mathematics. Computer scientists create the world to come. They model that also, and they also use mathematics. Whereas in the classical mathematics departments, and even in school, you're given mathematics as something that's already been discovered, and there's nothing more to do except learn it. And all of the mathematics that you would need to know primarily comes through computing rather than through classical mathematics. So computer scientists uh, have an opportunity uh, of studying one of the foremost exciting uh, worlds of mathematics within computing departments. All of our programming languages that we use in computers today could not possibly exist without all the mathematics that we did to build it up in the first place. To study computer science, study you don't have to be fantastic at math, but you do have to be competent. You, do have to be competent. You, also you also need to know how the computer is physically made, and how, it works. and how it works. The whole essence is, if you're designing a computer, you must take, think of the computer as a complete thing. It starts at the very top level with very abstract software ideas, goes through the operating system, down through the microprocessors, through the building blocks, right down to the low-level transistors. The key to a good computer scientist is someone who understands these ideas from the top to the bottom. If you only understand part of that picture, you're only half a computer scientist. I'll give you uh, one example. Most modern computer systems are made from RISC processors. These are reduced instruction set computers, and these are this development has meant that computers double in power roughly every year to 18 months. This is a major achievement. But the ultimate, the, the design of the RISC processor has been made by people who understand the relationship between the software and the hardware. Without this understanding, this breakthrough could not have been achieved. The third fundamental area of computer science is programming, or software engineering. I think there is a very strong creative element in that in order to write computer programs, you have to basically express uh, a process for pro solving a problem in a form that a machine can interpret. And in order to do that, I think you have to have a really strong grasp of the way that human beings go about solving problems. And I think that's a fairly introspective process. I mean, to write a program to read Roman numerals, you have to understand what's, what's the process that human beings go through when they read Roman numerals. And so I really enjoy, I guess, the, um, uh, th those aspects of understanding how humans solve problems and transforming them into something that a computer can understand and interpret. This is the creativity. The creativity separates, essentially, the human aspect of things from the purely engineering aspect of things. So if you want to make an analogy maybe with something like architecture, with architecture your goal is to, say, build a building, okay, just make it really simple like that. And the building has to have a certain amount of area, accommodate a certain number of people, etc., etc. So you have distinct goals. But at the same time you still have a huge creative freedom to, to explore those goals and to explore what sort of solutions you can provide to those goals. And that's where the creative end of things comes in. It's similar with, with software. With software, you have very definite end goals in mind. You have a spec that you have to follow and you have to adhere to. But at the same time, there's a lot of creative energy going into software design, um, simply because there are no strict guidelines, there are no strict set of rules detailing exactly how these goals can be achieved.
Languages, both programming and natural, have always been very important in computer science. Well, some years ago, we took the software component of our computer science degree and added in courses in linguistics and a, and a natural language, which seemed to us a very logical combination because uh, natural language processing is going to be very important in the, in the computer area in the, in the near future. And we also, as a backup to that, uh, are going to emphasize artificial intelligence on this uh, course. Well, in general terms, linguistics is the study of language sort of in and of itself. And for many years, linguists have been developing theories about the nature of language. And essentially, the cross-fertilization between computer science and linguistics is that the ideas and the knowledge that linguists have developed turn out to be exactly the sort of ideas and knowledge that you need to develop programs that will also understand language. One of the attractions of it is that students go to France or Germany in their third year uh, on the Erasmus program, so they get, and we recognize that for credit, so they, they have find a valuable year uh, abroad. Besides providing a good grounding in computing, the computer science department also tries to keep students at the cutting edge. It does this principally by engaging in research. Within a university environment, it's crucially important that the academics are actually actively engaged in their own particular fields. Right? And you then get a loop right, where the academics are kept motivated. They come up with new ideas, new avenues, some of which never come to anything. But that's fine. Right? Because, as Newman said, the purpose of university is the pursuit of knowledge for its own sake. Right? Sometimes these ideas result in spin-off companies, creating employment, jobs, etc., etc. And this is very beneficial and is obviously very important in these modern times. Quite often, uh, the, the graduates from Computer Science and Trinity College go on to become postgraduate researchers, uh, undertaking research projects in various different disciplines. Um, and this is important, the link between the research and the commercial domain is very tight. Many of the research groups in Trinity College have direct links with commerce, with industry. And in fact, many of the research groups come around because of the existence of these links between research and industry. My, my final year project was, uh, the official term was a graphics post-processor to DAXO. Uh, this was done uh, in conjunction with the Hitachi Research Center, which is set up on campus here. Um, basically, I was allowed into their facilities and I did some programming with one of their engineering projects. Um, my system would be closely linked to what you might see on the weather forecast, etc. It showed contour diagrams, heat plots, etc. for uh, engineering problems. Trinity College Dublin has for the last 10-11 years been working in how we managed to build a system to harness networks of computers all around the world and write applications for those networks. We've been researching into that area and we think we understand all the problems. And because we've been able to understand all the problems, we've been able to build a product. So we've, we've built this tool set and people are now saying, this is the tool set that will help me build my application. Therefore, they're willing to spend money with us and buy our tool set, our product. Another of these research projects is Open Labs. Well, the Open Labs project is uh, looking at laboratories, hospital laboratories, and trying to make them work better for patients. The idea is that laboratory tests, which are performed on blood samples and so on, to try and interpret those tests quickly and efficiently and accurately and get the results out to the, to the doctors as, as quickly as possible. There are a number of postgraduate students in the department who are working on the Open Labs project and there are also a number of students in their final year who are doing their project in this area and this is very beneficial for the students in the undergraduate course because they are exposed to very latest research techniques and they're also working in a practical setting and gaining valuable experience. Whether you decide to leave after your primary degree or go on to pursue a postgraduate course, the job prospects are excellent. And because computers are in almost every field, a computer science degree opens doors into a wide range of careers. After um, I did my first degree, which was the BA Mod Computer Science, so I did the pure computer science degree course, 
I then went on and did an MSc in computer science, which was by research alone. And that was purely my choice. It wasn't because I had to. I could have got a job at the end of doing my first degree, but I decided to go on. As a treat to myself after getting my master's, I took myself off to Australia for a year. And that was very good. I went out. I had no job lined up. I just knew I wanted to travel for a while and work while traveling. So I went to um, Perth in Western Australia, and I got a job there without much difficulty. Computer scientists can basically do whatever they like. I mean, if you look at our own class, people who graduated with me, there's people doing everything, absolutely everything. Well, the degree is certainly recognized abroad. If I look at just the people I graduated with, over half of them have worked at one point in time abroad. And by abroad, I mean England, I mean Germany, I mean Holland, France, America, Spain, Australia. And that's just a name where I know people have been. Well, Anderson's up to now have had a policy of taking in people from every degree, because now they're trying to concentrate on getting more technical people. But the general experience has been that people from Trinity and from a Trinity background are better as they move up through their careers because they have a broader outlook on things. Job prospects and a degree aren't the only reasons for coming to Trinity. The social life is great in Trinity, definitely, because you know you are in the city centre. And uh, I mean, there's numerous advantages in that. Like, you know, if you have a flat anywhere, like most students live in that mines and places like that, and like three or four miles away, if you do go out, like, uh, you know, you can just walk home and things like that because you go out in the city. And, you know, it's, it's so much handier. There's so much, there's such a choice in terms of places to eat, in terms of places, you know, to go to pubs and nightclubs and stuff. You know, you go in the door, and it is different. Um, the, the nice thing is that, you know, after you've been in the door a while, you actually like that difference because you feel part of whatever it is that Trinity engenders among the student population. I mean, Trinity doesn't go out to do it deliberately. It just happens that the, the atmosphere and the setting and the history of the place engender the people who go in there to create an atmosphere, uh, which is which you really get very fond of over time. It's like the fact that the campus is like over 400 years old is really attractive. It's lovely to come in in the morning, you know, through, through the front arch and see, you know, this 400-year-old campus. It's very, it's very nice. Um, and it makes it, you know, it's not like going to school anymore. Like you really feel, you know, I'm in university, you know. Um, it makes a difference. It, like it sounds trivial, but it actually it does kind of make a difference. I remember distinctly coming in on a, on a February morning at about four o'clock in the morning after being out <coughs> imbibing and you just I just you just walked in and there was no one in front square and the moon was up and you just went wow it's it's unbelievable <laughs>